so uh, th this is what I'm going to talk about, really, a bit of history, um, talk about the people, because the, the centre is nothing without people, um, run through our research themes, some of which you'll hear a little bit more about anyway, um, talk about the education programmes we offer, um, our partners, and uh, a very brief word on grants, and then I'll, I'll hand over to, uh, to our main speakers. Um, there's a prize for any, anyone who hasn't been at Queen Mary for telling me what that picture on the right is. Um, history. So back in 2001, um, I left King's College London, not very far away from Queen Mary, and joined uh, Queen Mary um, along with Josh Rice. I don't think there's anybody else from that 10 who, who uh, joined. Uh, and we formed the DSP Research Group in the Department of Electronic Engineering. And then a couple of years later, uh, I was invited to found the centre. Um, it wasn't my idea, I have to say. It was um, an idea that came from um, the principal's office, the, one of the vice principals. And um, uh, with that came uh, an offer of a significant amount of money, which enabled us to build our listening room, a picture of which you see on the bottom right. And as it was before we took it over, the top right. Actually, that's a long time before we took it over. You can tell by the way the guys dress, but it was an anechoic chamber that was built into the building and we took it over. Um, we had a lot of success with grants. We won uh, a large doctoral training centre grant, which has delivered over 50 PhD graduates. Uh, in 2001, we won a large programme grant, which is uh, several million pounds of, of grant money back in 2014. Um, in a historical vein, the, our Department of Electronic Engineering joined with computer science, and I think that it was to, to, all, to all at Queen Mary a very sensible thing to happen, and particularly valuable for, for us in c for dm because we were spanning not only uh, music and electronic engineering, but many other disciplines most strongly of which was computer science. So uh, a very healthy thing to happen for us back in 2010. Um, sorry, it's 2008, I think it merged. I've got, got my slides wrong. Um, we uh, had we, more success followed with uh, a re renewing of the large uh, doctor training center it, as a center for doctor training because jargon has to change. And then we got another large one, which is funding a load more students that many of you might be aware of uh, in AI and music. Uh, people, um, that's the most recent photo I could find. You'll see me at the middle, in the middle, uh, but most of the people in the picture aren't with us anymore. Um, and that's, well, that's just the way it is with uh, university research groups, but we have quite a turnover of the academics, which is healthy too. So you'll see, Bob Sturm, Sebastian, Sebastian Aber there, uh, Elaine Chu, all have uh, since left and some others, but um, I'll move on. And people have left us to go to some really impressive places. Uh, we have currently around, and it's hard to know precisely, 70 permanent researchers. Um, we've got each year now of around 20, maybe a few more 20 odd MSc students doing our sound and music computing degree. And uh, the sorts of places our researchers go are uh, some places in Singapore, very highly regarded research, There's two or three ex-researchers who've gone there. Uh, prominently Apple, Spotify, BBC, Universal Music, Tencent Bike Dance, and many, many more um, all over the world, really. Um, our research themes um, fall under these headings, really. Music informatics is probably the largest um, collection of particularly the academics um, and uh, it, it is, um, is where the AI and music CDT falls mainly but not entirely by any means. Um, we have augmented instruments, uh, we don't, don't think we have a talk from, from, uh, in that theme today, audio engineering, um, sonic interaction design, sound synthesis, machine listening, and uh, I've just learned, uh, new for 2021, um, I've given a choice of two, two, two titles there, but uh, Harris will tell you about that later. Uh, he's 
most likely to call that communication acoustics. Um, I'd invite you to look on our web pages to find out more about all of these uh, research areas, um, if they're of interest to you. And I also just point out that we have a music cognition lab, uh, which is joint with our cognitive science research group. And if anyone really finds that interesting, um, they have their webinar tomorrow. Um, it might be too late for you to register. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's worth finding out if you're really into it. Educationally, um, we have the highest concentration of centres for doctoral training in Queen Mary. Pretty much every single one in Queen Mary, bar one, uh, has something to do with the Centre for Digital Music. Um, we host, Nick Ryan Kins is the director, we host the CDT in Media and Arts Technology, 50% roughly of which uh, of the students are, in, do, are doing music related research. We have the CDT in AI and Music, uh, Simon Dixon is the director of that. We, uh, two of us, Nick, Brian Kins and myself, are involved in the CDT in Data-Centric Engineering, um, which is a new, uh, a new enterprise. Uh, we have a mini CDT in Data-Informed, this is a mouthful, Data-Informed Audience-Centric Media Engineering, so we call it DAME, uh, which is just a very small uh, CDT at the moment and we also have PhD students who are funded by a variety of, of resources. Um, we have, I mentioned, the MSc in Sound and Music Computing and we have uh, modules available in other MSc programmes which means for example a student studying uh, our AI masters could basically do a specialism in, in audio and music. And on the right you see the logos at the top for our uh, MAT CDT, then the A uh, AI music one, and then the data centric engineering uh, logo. Partners, uh, we're very, very proud of the number of partners we have, and, and hopefully, without knowing the names of the attendees, some of you are, are looking to become our future partners too. We have um, at least, in fact, several more than 20 partners in our. CDT in, A in AI and music. Uh, we have had uh, many, many uh, for the other CDT in media and arts technology. Um, and there are so many names. Uh, it, it was a fruitless exercise to try and list them all. So I picked on a few big, big names. Apple, where two of our XPH, no, maybe it's three of our XPHD students work. BBC, about four or five XPHD students work. One at Universal, one at Sonos. Um, I won't go into it any further. And then our academic partners, I'm very glad I put UPF there if Frederick's on the call, um, both in the UK where we have, have typically have a, a shared large research grant with these, with these uh, partners and um, across the world, particularly strong in, the, uh, in North America where we've signed agreements with Georgia Tech and McGill. Uh, and we have shared research programs with uh, most of those others or students have recently gone there. And lastly, I think this is my last uh, information slide, our grants. I, I, we keep a list on the web. Um, thank you, Emmanuel Benitos, for keeping that up to date. The current portfolio is standing at £13 million. Um, in some cases, uh, a C for DM academic isn't the PI, the pr principal investigator, but in most cases, these are led by C for DM academics. Uh, that includes three CDTs, one fellowship, funding from all the major funders. And we've also not very long since finished other major grants that I'm just mentioning below, which I'm not including in the, in the 13 million. Um, Okay, I think that was my last slide. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, our showcase coming up. Um, we don't have 10 talks uh, unless, unless uh, there has been a late arrival. Um, so it looks like it'll only be nine talks. Six are from PhD students, one from a postdoc and um, two academics, possibly a third academic if uh, he's able to come, which uh, seems uh, unlikely at the moment. Um, what I would ask, I'll mention, I mentioned this in my sort of warm-up, I'll say it again for those who, who um, weren't able to join 
at the very beginning. Um, we'd love you to ask questions uh, and we hope we are able to answer them, um, but please post these using the Q&A tab, not the chat tab. Um, uh, it works in a way that uh, if a presenter wants to respond on in that box, they can, and the system automatically tallies questions that have been answered. Or it might be that uh, the presenter or myself would, would rather answer at the end of all the presentations. We have plenty of time after the presentations to uh, have a discussion, to ask, answer, certainly to answer questions. Um, and that should be the, uh, that should all work. And yes, lastly, please bear with us and particularly me because I've never run one of these before. Uh, fingers crossed so far so good, uh, but I'm not even sure there's anyone there. So um, I'm going to move on to our showcase and I will stop sharing the screen and invite Saraja to start any second. So, right now, great. Hi everyone, I'm Sarja Sarkar, a second year PhD student at the AI and Music CDT at Center for Digital Music, and my research is focused on audio source separation. Any song or musical piece typically consists of multiple instruments playing in harmony. The task of an audio source separation model would be to extract from the mixed song the separate individual instruments present in the song, like for example the drums, the vocals, and the bass. As of today, the state-of-the-art approaches to solve speech separation are based on time-domain neural networks. But in the field of music separation, we still use spectrogram masking-based deep learning networks. Such methods are successful at separating instruments that have distinctive spectral and temporal characteristics, like vocals and drums, which can be separated well with minimal distortion. But these methods do not perform as well when the sources are very similar to each other, like in choral mixtures, where there are multiple vocalists singing in harmony and they have a lot of spectral overlap. Our work has tried to overcome this problem using end-to-end time-domain deep learning models, where the input is the raw audio signal at a high sampling rate instead of the short-time Fourier transforms. Using this, we have achieved results which are far superior to the current state-of-art frequency domain separation algorithms. Here is an example use case for the model we trained. We'll first play the choir mixture which is presented as the input to the model. Now you can hear the ground truth which the model tries to predict. Hear with joy before thy throne. And this is what our model is able to predict. Hear with joy before thy throne. Here is another one of the four parts in the mixture, although this one comes out slightly noisier. As we can hear, the separation quality is actually quite good but there are distinct artifacts that don't sound as good. Our current research is focused on improving the perceptual quality of our output. While we are also working on extending such algorithms for other instruments, this in conjunction with the research of my colleagues in automatic mixing will hopefully make music content creation much easier for the masses in the near future. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, ask me in the Q and A's or contact me personally later if you don't find the time. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Next uh, is uh, is Veronica. Hi. 
I hope you can all see the slides. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Veronica Morphy and this is a brief presentation about my collaborators and I ongoing research, which involves machine learning for bird acoustic perceptual studies. We are basically trying to build a model that can judge sound similarity the same way the birds do. Acoustic perception is studied in animals for its analogies to human perception and more specifically vocal learning by birds is one of our main models for human speech and human auditions is other primates show no signs of vocal learning. Uh, we want to learn um, which birds accurately learn sounds and why they do, but in order to do so in a valid way, we need to compare the bird sounds uh, the way that birds themselves perceive those sounds. So this is an example of a perceptual space. Its sound is mapped into a unique location in it, and similarity between two sounds can be measured by the distance between them in the space. The closer two sounds are to each other, the more similar they are considered to be. In order to build this kind of space for birds, we had to ask them for their judgments on sound similarity. Hence, we built filter, feeders like this one that had speakers that would play different sounds and force the bird to make side decisions based on the sound. During training, we played two sounds, sound A forcing the bird to go to the left birds and sound B forcing the bird to go to the right birds. Um, after the birds learned those sounds, we play them a third sound, sound X, and then we recorded their side selection. We consider that whichever side they, cho they whichever side <laughs> they chose for X, um, X is more similar to the training stimuli from that side. This type of XP judgments were were collected for a few months, and then we adapted those data into a deep learning triplet law setting, where a network is trying to build this perceptual space based on the judgments from the birds. Um, in this setting, the sound X corresponds to an anchor, and the sounds A and B can be either positive or negative examples for that sound, depending on the side selection for X. Our aim is to build a space where the distance between anchor and positive will be less than the distance between anchor and negative. And some further questions that we would like to answer with this research are whether or not different bird species judge sounds the same way, and if humans perceive sound the same way as birds. And this is all. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Veronica. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Mathieu to uh, tell us about uh, it musical interfaces. Thanks, Mark. I'll uh, share my screen now and play a short video. Hello, my name is Mathieu Barthé and I'm a senior lecturer in digital media. I'm going to introduce you to work on intelligent musical interfaces for extended reality. My research lies at the intersection of music perception, music information research, and human-computer interaction. I'm interested in finding out how audiovisual media and technology can extend rather than replace existing human activities. The work I'm conducting with PhDs and postdoctoral researchers can be positioned along the reality-virtuality continuum. Some of the systems we are developing are anchored in real environments, appearing on the left, while others are anchored in virtual reality environments, appearing on the right. Systems in between address mixed reality. One of the aims of Andrea Matelny's PhD on augmented guitar is to extend the sonic qualities of a traditional musical instrument, the acoustic guitar, for a specific style of playing called percussive fingerstyle. In percussive fingerstyle, guitarists play not only melodies and chords, but also a percussive rhythmic accompaniment by hitting the body of the guitar with their hands to produce drum-like sounds. We are developing an intelligent system embedded into the guitar which detects percussive gestures in real time and maps them to corresponding sounds using synthesis. Applications of this work range from the one-woman or one-man band to live stage and studio recording. I'll play a short video where you see Andrea perform with his first prototype.
the following project, which I conducted with postdoctoral researcher Rod Selfridge and two industry partners, Fracture Reality and Sensing Feeling, we were interested in developing novel immersive experiences for audiences of live music using augmented and mixed reality. We combine IoT-based sensing of musical expression and emotion with computer-generated imagery to produce live music visualizations. These visualizations can be experienced by audiences either through a mobile device app or through Microsoft HoloLens Mixed Reality head-mounted displays. I'll play a short video demonstrating our prototype where you'll see music responsive visuals superimposed to stage elements. Thomas Deacon's PhD addresses the needs and communication patterns of musicians in the studio to inform the design of tools for music post-production in virtual reality. You can see at the bottom a screenshot of a system letting performers specialize music tracks in 3D in a fully virtual environment. This work has applications for the production of immersive content for new media. Thank you for your attention. Hi, great. Thank you, Mathieu. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Pedro. Thank you. I'll now share the screen. Hello, everyone. My name is Pedro, and I'm very glad to be here. Today, we'll be talking about Musical Smart City, AI and Sonification to Make Sense of IoT Data. This is my PhD topic and is supervised by Mathieu Barthé and done in collaboration with Olonic Systems. Smart cities can be described as urban areas with embedded sensor networks that collect data towards an efficient management of assets and resources. Interpreting smart city data might bring opportunities for citizens to increase awareness of their environment. However, there's clearly a deficit regarding the use of the audio modality for this purpose. This led us to think how can we use music to make sense of IoT data in the context of smart cities. For that, we can rely on sonification, the use of non-speech audio to convey information. Here we have an example, which is the geiger muller counter, which is focused on this perspective of conveyance of information, and one that is focused more on the aesthetics, like the piece by Brazilian composer Heitor Villalobos, where he maps heights of buildings in the New York City to notes on the piano. Our vision of a musical smart city can be described as a location-based system that is able to increase inhabitants' urban awareness within a city, while at the same time accounting for an exploration of their environment in a musical way. And we propose to reach this vision by dividing the space into two major areas, environment and user. The first one will focus on smart city data, such as air pollution, crime rate, or weather, and the second one on user-related data gathered from smart devices, data such as head movement, gaze direction, location, heart rate. Here, AI and machine learning techniques can be used to either achieve dimensionality reduction on data sets or to guide music generation. would like to present an environment-driven sonification prototype where air pollution values gathered at the station in Mile End Road, London from a week in 2019 and a correspondent week during lockdown in 2020 are mapped to a spectral delay effect that is applied over a piece called Air on the G-String by Bach. Here we can notice an increasing tension when the pollution date is higher in 2019 compared to the first lockdown period in 2020 due to the activations of spectral delay triggered by the IoT data.
you very much for your attention. You can find more information on the links below. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, oh, right. Next up, we have uh, Emir. Yeah, can you see my screen? Cool. All right. So um, the science of automatic speech recognition have advanced greatly in the last few decades uh, that have become impactful in our daily lives. Technologies including Apple Siri, Amazon's Alexa, um, Google's automatic translation engine, uh, YouTube's automatic captioning tools, they all uh, essentially rely on a powerful speech recognition engine. Um, so what do speech recognizers do? Broadly speaking, um, they translate speech signals into a form of written text. Using such a system, it is possible to retrieve the lyrics of songs from singing performances. This procedure is generally refer referred as automatic lyrics transcription in the literature, which is the direction I've taken in my PhD research. To summarize, a lyrics transcriber recognizes the words from sung utterances through modeling the acoustic, linguistic, and the phonetic characteristics of singing voice. We have taken a data-driven approach and utilized advanced artificial intelligence techniques, referred as deep neural networks, for building the lyrics transcriber. Um, without going into much detail, I'd like to uh, show a few examples to demonstrate what our system, what a lyrics transcriber actually does. So I'm going to be showing a video, but before that, I'll just have to make sure that uh, the sound quality is all right. What's happening? Anyways, we'll just share it this way. Yep, and in the next one, I'll show an example where there is uh, musical instruments in the background, a polyphonic music example. That's it. Um, so I'm Emir Demirel, and here is my email address if you want to chat a bit, little bit more about lyrics transcription. Um, thanks. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Emir. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Elena. Just a second. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you in advance for listening.
could you move on to the next presentation? I'll do it after that. I'm having some trouble. That's fine, dear. Don't worry. Uh, Gary, are you ready? I'm happy to do that, Mark. Thank Lovely. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm just sharing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Bromham. Um, I'm a part-time uh, PhD researcher at Queen Mary and also uh, a, a music producer. I have 30 years of experience of songwriting, music production and mixing. Um, I'm going to just talk very briefly about um, intelligent audio effects. Um, beforehand, I just want to create a little bit of context here in terms of what we're talking about when we speak of music production. Um, so very loosely, I would define uh, music production as being the process of developing, creating and refining recorded music for um, consumption. Um, it can also refer to a number of things. It has a whole kind of life cycle, if you like, um, for everything from composition through to sound design, mixing and mastering. Um, and uh, it may have not uh, gone beyond everyone's kind of uh, uh, beyond their notice that it's often based on many traditional practices and paradigms. Um, what is intelligent music production? So intelligent music production is the approach of bringing some artificial intelligence to the field um, of the aforementioned uh, music production. Um, and intelligent mixing systems have the capacity to work alongside uh, mix engineers providing support and, uh, and also working in a collaborative kind of capacity, if you like. Um, intelligent audio effects. So let me define. So an audio effect is the part of a music production chain or system that manipulates um, a piece of audio with a set of predefined parameters. Intelligent audio effects use data gathered from systems um, such as machine learning, um, possibly grounded theory, um, to inform parameter mappings, which change when you manip manipulate that signal. Um, and I'd like to point out here uh, that the greatest limitation factor is, is down to the quantity and also, of course, the quality of that data. Um, so I'm just going to show you very briefly, just give you a, an example um, of a dynamic range compressor um, that's using a piece of reference audio and comparing that with a data set to set parameters um, within the compressor interface. A um, couple of points to note here that understanding all of the functions of a compressor, it can be quite problematic for people and sometimes those parameters don't uh, always map to perceptually obvious um, factors. So this is quite a useful tool um, for amateurs. Um, in terms of the, uh, the use of semantic descriptors and also the use of a piece of reference audio, sometimes that's a much better way um, to work out what is actually uh, what, what is actually the function of, uh, of the compressor. So I'll just move on. I'll give you a very brief demo here. Then I'll explain a little bit about this. That's probably all we need to see. Um, so here's a very brief um, flow diagram. So you can see the live audio being fed in. We then, um, you could see me dragging a piece of reference audio into the compressor, um, which is so a similarity with um, the data set. So it's compared and the resultant uh, parameters are mapped to uh, the compressor interface. Um, I want to make a couple of other points um, about the context of intelligent music systems, because I think this is something which certainly resonates with me as a music producer. Um, the the idea uh, of IMS or intelligent music systems being effective, they need to be adaptive and they need to take context into account. We often find when we gather the data that the outliers or the, or the exceptions are where the interesting part happens. And often people say, uh, actually, that's where maybe the creativity and the spontaneity um, uh, is, is most obvious. Um, why do we care about this? Why do we care about this kind of technology? Why is it interesting? Um, as an amateur music maker, you can often find uh, the it's quite daunting trying to navigate your way around um, uh, parameters within audio interfaces and something that kind of uses tacit knowledge taken from expert users um, and mapping those onto parameters can be an easier way uh, to achieve a, a professional or a better end result. 
Um, professional mix engineers can also benefit from this because of course it can assist their workflow and streamline it and make uh, their, their, their whole kind of process much easier. Um, final point I just want to make here is in terms of a co-creative music system it can also um, human and computer interacting with each other can also create a more varied set of um, uh, parameters sometimes where you it, which may lead to more uh, creative possibilities with audio. Thank you. Thank you Gary, uh, especially for stepping up a couple of minutes earlier than you were you were prepared for. Um, Eleanor, are you okay now? Do you think, or shall? Okay, you're fingers crossed. You're on mute, by the way, Eleanor. Okay, that's why. Sorry. <laughs> I wonder if that was. Yeah, maybe I that's... Think that was the problem. Okay, one more time. This should work. Yeah. Hi, everyone, and thank you in advance for listening and your interest in our topic. My name is Elona Shatri and I work with George Fasekas in Optical Music Recognition or OMR. We also have a very close collaboration with our industry partner Steinberg. Optical Music Recognition concerns itself with computationally reading and retrieving musical information from documents. Said in simpler words, it tries to retrieve the actual music notation and semantics from sheet music generating in the end, a machine-readable file. In order for musicians to use images of sheet music to further develop their music by editing, creating demos, adding missing voices, choosing engraving styles, and just using the substantial amount of existing music tools and software, we need OMR. OMR also uh, is helpful in computational analysis and searchability of music. Also helps digital musicology by enabling studies across different tradition, genre, culture, time periods, and composers. Furthermore, it would allow conversions to different sheet music formats, for instance, braille music notation, and the ability to archive musical heritage. The traditional OMR pipeline starts with some simple computer, uh, computer vision tasks, such as binarization. It moves on to object detection, where deep learning has come into place, which does not stand true for the next stage, that of musical notes uh, reconstruction, where music semantics come into place. As of today, most of the work focuses on musical rules and heuristics, and some work was also done with machine learning, but is limited to monophonic, very simple scores. Of course, in the end, it is crucial to encode such knowledge built in the lost task of the pipeline into files that are machine readable, such as MIDI, Music XML, MEI. In hopes of contributing to the OMR research, and particularly using deep learning in OMR, we are creating our own data set. This data set is said to be more inclusive, inclusive and uh, is able to satisfy all OMR stages. Here is the list of the elements that our data set has up today, expecting to have more in the future, mainly looking at how can we better represent the semantics of music. Here are some preliminary results for the second stage, that of object detection. These experiments were done using 1000 images and the scores show how well are these objects detected in a very simple words. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, please drop them by me. Have a good day. Thank you, thank you. Uh, right, uh, next is uh, Angeliki. Yes, I hope hopefully you can hear me and see me and hopefully I can share my screen as well. Um,
Okay, so I'm going to give you a short sample with the video, um, but I will also share um, a YouTube video for you for a more detailed technical description of my project. Okay, so let's see. Hi everyone, I'm Mageliki Murgela and today I'm presenting my project, Hearing Loss Simulation, which is part of my PhD research on intelligent broadcast audio mixing for hearing loss. The idea behind this project comes from three questions. First question is, how does hearing loss sound? In other words, how can we, as researchers, experience the effects of hearing loss? And what are the key auditory functions it affects? So what are the perceptual struggles it produces for the affected individual? And finally, how can we use this knowledge effectively when seeking audio enhancement methods? Which brought us to this implementation, a hearing loss simulation in the form of an audio effects plugin for easier incorporation in audio production. This simulation reproduces four perceptual aspects of hearing loss. High frequency attenuation, spectral smearing, rapid loudness growth, and temporal disruption. The simulation is built to provide a real-time capability and customizability, therefore serving as an intuitive and interactive tool towards exploring the effects of hearing loss on audio in the stage of production. To assess the performance and response of the simulation, we tested each of the four processors using test signals. The following plots present the response of the high-frequency attenuation processor using white noise, the spectral smearing processor using a 2 kHz pure tone, the rapid loudness growth processor using a RAMP function, and lastly the temporal disruption processor using a 5 Hz pure tone. I will finish this presentation with a short demonstration of the simulation in action using several settings on a mix of speech, ambience and soundtrack. You will first hear the raw audio, followed by the audio coming through the simulation with several parameters and changing real time. Since 1995, gray wolves have been captured from Canada and brought to the United States to Yellowstone National Park. The wolf population is growing again in the western region of the United States. Elk, moose, and deer population have gone back down to a size because the wolves are hunting them again. The wolves eat just the right number of these other animals to keep balance in the ecosystem. The trees are growing again. Squirrels, mice, and other mammals are coming back because they now have the trees they need. Beavers have returned and are building. Thank you for your attention. And so, uh, assuming I've kept track properly, um, our final speaker is uh, Harris. Thank you, Mark. Hope um, everybody can see my screen. Um, I will be uh, talking, as Mark said earlier, about um, uh, introducing a new research theme within the Center for Digital Music. Um, tentatively, I've gone for communication acoustics, but um, I'm happy to consider other ideas. Um, this is a work in progress. Um, uh, so, uh, communication acoustics refers to um, the study of acoustics that are relevant for the communication between humans and uh, between humans and machines. Um, we will approach that focusing on perception, cognition, and aesthetics of sound, uh, cross-model and multisensory perception involving sound, using that knowledge to enable digital music research with an understanding of how we hear and uh, modeling human values and biases with digital music data. Um, uh, this research um, crosses several C4DM themes already, including audio engineering, augmented instruments, machine listening, and sound synthesis. Um, speaking of sound synthesis, uh, one of the current topics um, that uh, PhD students Ben Hayes and Cyrus Vahidi are looking at um, is understanding the perception and semantic description of uh, synthesizer sounds. Uh, so moving away from uh, musical instruments um, uh, to inform neural audio synthesis uh, systems. Um, we collaborate with uh, uh, George Fazekas at the Center for Digital Music and Martin Benning at the School of Mathematical Sciences. And we have the uh, special interest group um, that um, uh, Ben and uh, Cyrus are running. The second um, uh, main topic at the moment is uh, 
using digital music data as an observatory of human values and biases. And uh, this is in collaboration with uh, several people within Queen Mary, um, with the ISI Foundation in Italy and the BBC Data Science Research Partnership. Um, Luca uh, just started his PhD and he will be looking at uncovering gender and coding uh, strategies in sound and music. Um, and um, Vioza will join us in January um, as part of a new center for this, uh, sorry, a new um, uh, center for doctoral training. Um, where we will look at predicting demographics, personality traits, and human values from uh, streaming um, data, streaming information uh, in music and other media. Um, I hope you can see the video. Um, we had um, a master student um, last year who developed um, a Timber Explorer interface um, where uh, people can explore different salient um, dimensions of timbre um, and how they um, how these are heard. And this is uh, part of a more general um, effort um, to develop physical and web tools for education, outreach and research. Um, and um, in sort of a similar um, approach to developing tools for the for the research community and the broader community, um, in collaboration with uh, the ACTOR partnership um, based at McGill University in Canada, um, me and some colleagues there are currently developing an orchestral timber semantics um, database that can be used for um, psychology and music information retrieval research. Um, so closing that uh, very short introduction, um, these are some of the topics that I'm looking into with colleagues uh, in the UK um, and abroad. Um, uh, timbral brightness perception and the neural underpinnings, um, understanding uh, variation in sensory experience um, and uh, the how time is perceived in a more binaural uh, context. Um, and um, we, I think somebody also asked about that in, in the questions, um, as I saw a bit earlier. Um, uh, so uh, we have a PhD finding opportunity coming up for um, autumn 2021 entry. Um, learning timer specific word embedding for semantic audio applications. This is uh, together with George Fazekas. Um, so we are looking for students, uh, candidates who would be interested. And we're also seeking um, uh, industry partners uh, who might be interested in this uh, topic and uh, could either support the students or provide in-kind contribution. Um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions um, uh, later.